In this video, we're going to work some problems from practice exam 3.1 in the spring 2023 semester, starting with questions related to balancing redox reactions, electrochemistry, and galvanic cells. So first here, we have a balanced redox reaction involving copper, NO, and H2O. And we are tasked with identifying the oxidizing and reducing agents for the forward reaction as written. So first, some general comments about oxidizing and reducing agents. One of the first things you want to do here is look for changes in oxidation number. This indicates where oxidation and reduction have occurred. The reducing agent is the species that donates the electrons in the electron transfer process. In the process, it becomes oxidized itself, but it reduces the other reaction partner. That's why it's called the reducing agent. Likewise, the oxidizing agent is the thing that accepts those electrons. It pulls electrons away from the other reactant, causing oxidation in the other reactant, while the oxidizing agent itself is reduced. All right, so before we get into that, let's identify the changes in oxidation number that are occurring in this reaction. And the first one that jumps out to me is copper. Copper goes from being 2 plus on the reactant side to 0 on the product side. And the total change in charge is from plus 6 on the left. We got 3 coppers plus 2 to 0 on the right, 3 coppers at an oxidation state of 0. The nitrogen-containing species are a little bit trickier, but easiest to parse if we draw out Lewis structures for each of them. So let's start with the NO. Here's a Lewis structure for NO, and if we do the oxidation number math here, the O is in an oxidation state of negative 2, and the N is in an oxidation state of positive 2. If we then look at HNO3, again, we're going to want to draw a Lewis structure here and think about the oxidation numbers of all the atoms connected to nitrogen. We've got three oxygens, each of which has a charge or an oxidation number of negative 2. And we've got hydrogen connected to this oxygen at plus 1, not directly relevant, but helps us see that the nitrogen must be in the oxidation state of plus 5. So here there's a net increase in oxidation number from plus 2 to plus 5 with 2 nitrogen-containing molecules involved. We've got a total change again of six, an increase in the oxidation number of six units overall. Okay, so what's going on? What we've noticed here is that the copper is gaining six electrons and going from three Cu2 pluses to three neutral Cu's, while the nitrogen-containing species is losing six electrons and going from two NO's to two HNO3's. So we can think about this as six electrons being transferred from the NO to the Cu2+. And this helps us see what the oxidizing and reducing agents are. NO is the reducing agent. It is the thing that is donating the electrons to the other reactant. And it's, notice, causing reduction in the copper reactant. So NO here is the reducing agent. Notice that NO itself is oxidized. The product is more oxidized than the starting material. The reducing agent undergoes oxidation or is oxidized itself. The copper 2 plus, on the other hand, is the oxidizing agent. It's the thing that is accepting these six electrons, and it's thereby causing oxidation in the other reactant. It's causing the oxidation of NO. This makes it the oxidizing agent, while it itself is reduced from copper 2 plus to elemental copper. In this problem, we're looking to balance the overall redox reaction involving these two given half reactions and ultimately identify the coefficient, the stoichiometric coefficient on Br2 in the overall balanced chemical equation when it takes place in acidic solution. Now something we should notice right off the bat with respect to this whole idea of the reaction occurring in acidic solution is that there is no hydrogen and there is no oxygen in the half reactions. And so the fact that this reaction takes place in acidic solution is actually irrelevant. H plus and water are not involved in the electron transfer process at all. So we can ignore the fact that this reaction takes place in acidic solution. And we can also notice that the half reactions are already balanced on the atoms, right? I've got two bromines on the right, two bromines on the left. I've got one iron on the left and one iron on the right. And the half reactions are also balanced on charge. For example, here, neutral on the left, 
positive 3 and negative 3 on the right for an overall charge of 0. Here on the left, I've got a charge of negative 2. And on the right, I've got a charge of negative 2. So the half reactions are already individually balanced. So we can go right to the stage of scaling the half reactions so that the number of electrons lost in the oxidation process, which is this first reaction, is equal to the number of electrons gained in the reduction process, the second half reaction. Okay, so in order to equalize those numbers of electrons transferred, we have to notice how many electrons are lost in the oxidation, three, how many electrons are gained in the reduction, two. The lowest common multiple here of those two numbers is six, and so what we're gonna do is scale up each of these half reactions so that six electrons are transferred, multiplying the first reaction by two and the second half reaction by three, and then we're simply gonna add things together, scaling everything, right? The numbers of electrons and all the stoichiometric coefficients, that's emphasized by putting these orange square brackets around the entire half reaction. Okay, when we do that with the reactants, we get two Fe's, one Fe times two, and three Br2's, three, uh, one Br2 times three. And then on the product side, just for completeness, we end up with two Fe3 pluses, and we end up with six Br minuses on the product side. And so ultimately, the coefficient that appears on bromine, Br2, elemental bromine in the balanced chemical equation, is three. So again here, important point was that because no hydrogen or oxygen appear in either of the half reactions, the fact that this reaction is taking place in acidic solution is irrelevant, and the half reactions were already balanced. This is definitely something we'll want to check first, balanced on atoms and on charge, and so we could proceed right to the scaling and combining step to get the overall balanced equation. In question three here, we're not quite so lucky in that oxygen appears in one of the relevant half reactions. So here we're given an unbalanced redox reaction and essentially asked to balance it, determining ultimately the coefficient for water, the stoichiometric coefficient of water, and whether it appears on the reactant or product side when the overall equation is balanced. The first thing you should do here is split the given reactants and products into two half reactions, grouping species together that have similar atoms that are not hydrogen and oxygen. So looking here, for example, at sulfur and at chlorine, we see that the SO42- and the S2O32- are going to go together because both species contain sulfur, and the Cl- and the Cl2 are going to go together because both species contain chlorine. Once we've laid out these half reactions, we want to make sure to balance on atoms that are not hydrogen or oxygen first. I've actually already gone ahead and done that by noticing that there are two sulfurs in S2O32-, and so I'm going to need two sulfurs in uh, two SO42- minuses to ensure that sulfur is balanced. Two sulfurs on the left and two sulfurs on the right. We're also going to need two Cl- minuses in the left of the second half reaction since I've got two chlorines on the right-hand side here. Now let's think about balancing on oxygen and hydrogen up here. I would start with oxygen, noticing that I'm going to need um, some additional oxygens, right? I've only got three on the right-hand side, but I've got eight, four times two on the left-hand side. So I'm going to need five waters, five oxygens in the form of water on the right-hand side. And to balance on hydrogen at the same time, the way I like to do this is to imagine I'm in acidic solution and then worry about adding hydroxides later. So I'm going to add 10 H plus to the left-hand side to ensure we're balanced on hydrogen. I've got 10 H's on the left and 10 H's five times two on the right. Now, to sort of convert this into a basic situation, I'm going to add hydroxide to both sides to fully neutralize this H+. So I'm going to add 10 hydroxides. I know I need to add 10 because I need 10 OH- minuses to neutralize the 10 H+. Pluses. That's going to create 10 H2Os on the left-hand side, and the 10 hydroxides added to the right-hand side will just show up as an additional reactant like this. One more step we can take with this first half reaction is to notice, okay, I've got five waters on the product side and 10 waters on the reactant side, so I can subtract five waters from both sides to essentially eliminate the product side water. I've got five H2Os now only on the reactant side left over. So with the exception of charge, we're now entirely balanced on atoms. 
Next, we should make sure that each half reaction is balanced on charge, and we do that by taking stock of how much charge we've got on the reactant side and product side, and using electrons to equalize the two. So for example, in the first half reaction, I've got two times negative two, that's negative four on the left-hand side. On the right-hand side, I've got negative two plus the negative 10 due to the, due to the 10 hydroxides. Don't forget about those. And so I need eight negative charges on the left-hand side to ensure that charge is balanced. Now I've got negative 12 in total over here and negative 12 in total over here. And this is worth pausing and verifying if you're not sure. The second half reaction is much easier. I've got negative two on the left and no charge on the right. So I need two electrons on the right to balance the two negative charges on the left. So now the individual half reactions are balanced. And to get to the final overall balanced equation, we need to scale to equalize the number of electrons gained in the reduction, which is this first half reaction, and lost in the oxidation. And the nice thing here is we've got two electrons and eight electrons, and so all I need to do is scale this second half reaction by a factor of four. That actually doesn't affect the coefficient of water at all, so we can immediately notice without proceeding further that the coefficient of water is five, and it's going to appear on the reactant side. But just for completeness to show the overall balanced equation, we now add everything up to get the overall balanced equation. So I end up with two sulfates, two SO4, two minuses, five H2Os, eight chlorides from the second half reaction, and then on the product side, I've got one S2O3, two minus, four Cl2s, and the 10 hydroxides. Here we're asked about the true statements related to a galvanic cell based on the overall reaction below. And this overall reaction involves three F2s, I just kind of moved the three down from the line above, plus two ALs, to give six fluorides and two Al3 pluses. So the first thing I would do here is actually sort of a fundamental electrochemistry skill in looking for what is oxidized and what is reduced. How are electrons being transferred? It becomes apparent if you dig into oxidation number here that the F2 is undergoing reduction to F minus and the Al is undergoing oxidation to Al3 plus. Now, in the language of galvanic cells, we're gonna bring in terms like cathode, an anode and think about the directions electrons and ions will flow to get a handle of what the galvanic cell is actually going to look like and to do that let's draw a picture let's draw a picture of what the galvanic cell is actually going to look like so here's a pretty standard galvanic cell setup now this one's a little funky because f2 is a gas so we're going to have to bubble in that f2 via some sort of gas tube but we've got a solution of fluoride um, with in contact with F2 gas, that's one half cell. In the other half cell, we've got a solid piece of aluminum metal, that's this sort of um, unshaded blue rectangle here, in contact with a solution, aqueous solution, of Al3+, and a salt bridge connecting the two. Based on what we already said about the overall balanced chemical equation here, we see that aluminum is undergoing oxidation. So the half reaction occurring in that blue half cell is the oxidation of aluminum metal to aluminum three plus and three electrons. The reaction occurring in the right hand half cell is the reduction of F2 to F minus. And so oxidation is occurring in the left half cell and reduction in the right half cell. This means electrons are being lost, are heading up through the wire out of the blue half cell and across the wire and down into the red half cell as this galvanic cell discharges and, for example, you know, turns on a light bulb, powers a phone, does what it does with whatever electrical load we've got going on here. And so we can conclude that electrons are moving from the left half cell to the right half cell. That makes this blue half cell the anode and this half cell the cathode. Notice reduction is occurring at the cathode and oxidation at the anode here. So the true statements here, F minus is produced at the cathode. This is the electrode where reduction occurs and sure enough, F minus is produced. Aluminum solid is the anode electrode. Well, that's true. Aluminum solid is the electrode in the half cell where oxidation occurs, the anode. The other statements are, are false. Al3 plus is produced in the anode, not consumed. F2 is not oxidized at the cathode. F2 is reduced 
at the cathode. And F2 is the cathode electrode, I would argue, is, is false. Um, the cathode electrode is going to have to be some kind of conductive material. We may need to use, for example, an inert electrode like platinum here to transfer electrons, to, to move electrons through a conductive material. In this question, we have an image of an operating galvanic cell where the direction of electron flow is given, as well as the direction of ion flows in the salt bridge, and the species being produced and consumed as this cell operates. So we can see, for example, that Fe3 plus is becoming Fe2 plus, and magnesium solid is becoming magnesium 2 plus as this galvanic cell operates and electrons are flowing in this direction. So we can notice, for example, that the conversion of magnesium solid to magnesium 2 plus, well, that's an oxidation, right? And, and two electrons are lost from the magnesium solid. Since we're going to want to produce an overall balanced redox reaction, chemical equation for the redox process occurring here, we're going to want to notice that number of electrons transferred because equalizing that in the oxidation reduction half reactions is going to be important. On the right hand side, in the right hand half cell, we've got a reduction process of Fe3 plus to Fe2 plus, and there only one electron is transferred, right? Only one electron is gained by the Fe3 plus. So to provide, to generate an overall balanced chemical equation, we're going to need to double this half reaction. To get the overall balanced redox reaction, we add up the anodes half reaction and the cathodes half reaction, making sure to scale so that the overall number of electrons transferred uh, from both from or to both half cells are equal, right? We lose two electrons at the anode and we end up gaining two electrons at the cathode. So the overall balanced chemical equation looks like this. Magnesium solid reacts with two Fe3 pluses to give magnesium two plus and two Fe2 pluses. And I encourage you to pause and verify that this is balanced both on charge and on numbers and types of atoms.